Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the conference after the coffee break. Welcome to the first uh, plenary session on implementation of uh, smart, smart specialization uh, strategies. It's great to be here in Riga. Thank you very much for the, uh, for the invitation uh, by the Latvian Presidency, by the uh, State Education Agency and the Ministry for Education and uh, Science. Now it is my pleasure to introduce to you our uh, speakers and uh, discussion participants of the first uh, plenary session who will discuss with you the fascinating uh, concept of uh, smart specialization in, in regions. Um, so I would like to ask you to welcome with me Ms. Celina Viceva from DG Regio, Ms. Karen McGuire from the OECD, Mr. Günther Klar the chairman of the Commission's expert group on smart specialization, and Mr. Andrea Conte from the Joint Research Center in Sevilla. <laughs> the, objective, the objective of this, um, this plenary session is to um, look a bit closer at uh, smart specialization in regions, how it, how it works, does it work, uh, what are the tools to implement it? What are the tools to monitor and, uh, the, the implementation? The tools to adjust? Um, <laughs> I've asked the participants also to keep in mind in their presentations the, the regional perspective. We have um, representatives of the, of the Commission, the OECD, an expert group to the Commission. They look a bit um, from I don't want to say from Brussels, but they look a bit from the, um, globally on the, on the issue. And I ask them to also keep in mind uh, how, how regions can benefit from the concept, how they see uh, this smart uh, specialization uh, strategy. Um, and I hope we can come to this also later um, in, the dis in the discussion. Um, the idea is to um, have our speakers introduce the the, um, the topic, 10 minutes, 10, 12 minutes each, and then to engage in a discussion um, among themselves with you, depending on, on available time, depending on uh, the topics that uh, they, will, they will raise. So I'm very much um, looking forward to that, and um, I would um, first give the floor to Ms. Chalina uh, Viceva from DG Regio. She's a director for the uh, Competence Center for Smart and Sustainable uh, Growth and also responsible for the implementation of cohesion policy in Southern Europe, um, Spain, Greece, Italy. And uh, she also used to be responsible for the implementation of cohesion policy in Latvia. So she knows the place very well. So, Jelly. Thank you very much um, and good morning, uh, everyone. I would not uh, uh, save the time on thanks uh, to, to thank again the Latvian authorities for uh, inviting us to this conference, for the excellent organization, for letting us in this uh, very beautiful and historical place of uh, the Latvian Society House, and also for the very warm hospitality yesterday in a very nice setting in Urmala. Thank you very much. Uh, you've been very, very kind. Uh, hopefully we will pay off with uh, our contribution to the conference. Uh, now, my, my role here is uh, to talk a bit on the smart specialization process and uh, where do we stand in it and uh, what's next, what are the important steps. Um, maybe I will first of, uh, uh, first of all put the context and um, the overall setting of this uh, concept. Um, you know that the European Regional Development Fund and cohesion policy in general are there to uh, bridge uh, uh, the gap in development between regions. Uh, how are we trying to do that, to uh, push uh, up the, de the development, especially in the lagging uh, region, through growth, through increase of competitiveness, through creation of jobs. Um, and of course, uh, uh, more and more, uh, it is uh, a unanimous, um, uh, it, is, it is an agreement and a unanimous statement that competitiveness, the shortcut to competitiveness, is through knowledge-based economy. So from this point of view, the European Regional Development Fund, and especially um, uh, uh, in the next programming period, is trying to put a very high focus on innovation, on uh, research and development, but from the perspective of their contribution to growth. 
Uh, we realize that competitiveness is at stake uh, in global terms. We realize that in order to um, sustainably exit from the cr uh, crisis, we need uh, sustainable competitiveness. And sustainable competitiveness, Europe cannot achieve through competing um, with uh, uh, labor costs. Uh, or uh, any other cost of materials. The only way we can compete is through new ideas, new technologies, new products, and being as adept to the market needs as possible. So from this perspective, innovation is in the core of uh, our cohesion policy uh, for the next period. Uh, and the first step in uh, uh, demonstrating this focus is how much money we project for research and innovation. And throughout uh, the years, I have to say that this budget has been gradually increasing. If, for example, in 2000 and 2006 period it was only 6% for innovation, already in the 2007-13 period we have 25%. And this time around, it's not only that the budget goes up, the consolidated budget, but also we are trying to reach higher quality, efficiency, effectiveness, synergy, and all these keywords that relate to the quality of spending. So, there was a say already about these 40 billion uh, that have been already allocated in the negotiation process. However, the negotiation process is still ongoing. We uh, still need to negotiate 50 programs. Some of these programs have a very important budget in innovation. Uh, these are programs in Italy and Spain. So all in all, we will have a very uh, um, uh, substantive budget, over 40 billion, that will be tagged to the thematic objective of um, research and innovation. But immediately I will say that this is only the budget that strictly and uh, ex uh, exceptionally relates to, to the RIS-3 process, which is the research and innovation smart specialization strategies. But we have um, uh, also uh, a big budget in thematic objective three, which is support to competitiveness of enterprises also related to innovation, or ICT, thematic objective two, which is also research related, uh, or a low carbon economy. So all in all, if we put all that together, it will be well beyond 100 uh, a billion for the next seven year period that could be linked uh, very closely to research and innovation capacities. Now, uh, that is about the budget. About the quality of spending, because we know that it's not enough to spend money. What is uh, much more important, especially under circumstances of very limited uh, public resources, to spend this money wisely. This time around, we really focused on uh, prioritization. In uh, this morning, uh, Ms. Kiopo was um, asking the, this question, uh, the question of whether to spread money thinly or to concentrate. Our evaluations show, not only for innovation, that uh, if we spend money thinly and spread it uh, uh, all over the place, it doesn't give uh, um, results, the expected results, uh, and it becomes invisible. In order to have visibility, we need critical mass, and we need to focus in the right strengths where the money will produce the best effect. And this is how the smart specialization process came up. We want to build uh, uh, and invest into the areas of innovation and research which can bring the most uh, of the money that we spend. So that means to boost uh, existing strengths, to, uh, to boost uh, emerging market opportunities, and uh, uh, to match them with uh, uh, the effort of the researchers and uh, um, uh, the innovation system in the regions and member states. Um, one of the most important, I know that there will be um, a presentation specifically designed on the smart specialization process and the concept as such, but I, will, um, I would like to signal uh, maybe the most important element. I said already that we want to translate research and innovation into economic growth. So our, uh, our idea with the European Regional Development Fund is really to bridge the gap between the academic society and the business society. And this is the most important concept of entrepreneurial discovery uh, that um, underlies the whole process of uh, a smart specialization. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this entrepreneurial discovery meets all the stakeholders together of the triple, quadruple uh, helix and brings up the areas that will um, be in agreement between businesses and researchers 
uh, where the funds should concentrate in order uh, to have the best result for economy. Um, so these smart specialization strategies, they became an ex-ante conditionality for spending our money in innovation and research. So we will not spend uh, a euro beyond the areas that are there in the smart specialization strategies. And this is very important also in the context of the questions that I heard this morning, if a project can be eligible under thematic objective one, uh, research and innovation. Um, so the quality of spending uh, relates to where we invest, how much we prioritize, and of course, since our objectives relate to growth, how much it is close to the market needs. We want really to concentrate on the demand-driven innovation. And this is the, uh, the different scope of Horizon 2020 and what we uh, with, uh, uh, want to support with the European Regional Development Fund. Now, we are almost at the end of the negotiations. We set our programs and now the most important uh, uh, stage comes where we have to put in practice all the good words in the programs that are there to ensure the quality of spending. How this implementation process uh, 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 will uh, roll out? Um, the first step is uh, that we need to have um, this ex ante conditionality implemented because I have to say that in most of the cases uh, um, there are still elements in the smart specialization uh, process that are not there in many regions and member states. So we have to continue to perfect the strategy, the processes, the monitoring systems, everything that relates to this ex-ante conditionality. And this ex-ante conditionality is not just like this decided to be there. It is there to ensure efficiency. Uh, the next thing that we have to ensure is that the culture that we are trying to install uh, through the entrepreneurial uh, discovery is an ongoing process. We don't want that to end with the setting up of the, uh, of the strategies. It is even more important in the evolutionary uh, uh, process throughout the seven, ten years of implementation uh, so that this dialogue is not cut off afterwards but it continues and continues to feed the system of the smart specialization. Um, the next um, uh, point which is extremely important is how we are going to identify, uh, it's, it's not even us, although I'm using uh, uh, the first uh, 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 person uh, in, in, in my speech, it is the managing authorities, how they're going to identify the best projects. And here comes one of the tricky questions. In order to start selecting projects, you need selection criteria. The selection criteria have a crucial importance. They are um, uh, approved by the monitoring committees, by the member states. Monitoring committees are formations of the member state where the managing authorities is uh, one of the key stakeholders. And through the selection criteria, we, we uh, have the project selected and being implemented. So that means that if we want, from the high strategic point, through the program level, to reach the ground and get the right project, to get the right results, the results we intend, then the selection criteria are the missing and most important um, uh, uh, channel, uh, which is decided by the member states. So my plea here is, please participate as actively as possible in the process of designing the selection criteria. Because under the selection criteria, the projects will be selected in the calls announced by the managing authorities. Uh, so selection criteria is the first thing. Then um, continuing the culture of dialogue, the second thing. Continue involving the entrepreneurial um, uh, business, uh, 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 business community. Uh, these are elements on which our success depends. Uh, third element, we need to be very serious about monitoring and evaluation. I have to say that one of the most important strengths for the next generation of our policy is result orientation. We want um, from the very start to know the results we want to achieve and to head to these um, uh, uh, results in the most efficient way. So for that we need monitoring system and very sound evaluation so that we can change in the meantime anything that does not work well, including in the innovation and research. So build the system appropriately. Many of the regions already have this system. Now it's uh, the implementation modalities that need to be designed. Two more minutes or one minute? 
uh, one and a half. Synergies. Uh, on the synergy side, uh, there, there was a talk this morning. This is embedded already in the smart specialization, in our programs, that we need to find the shortcut and the most effective way of working, to, working together between the funds. Horizon 2020, COSME, a, any of the fund that have, has a relevance to a thematic, thematic objective has to be in the picture, in the strategic picture, so that we don't have duplication and we use the funds for their appropriate uh, purpose. Um, there, uh, we, and, and this is, and it, uh, if you remember from my commissioner statement, this is the right way to mobilize resources. Uh, another point that is extremely important, again, within the frame of the high needs and the limited resources, we need a higher leverage, and the, the highest possible leverage can be one of the selection criteria, for example. Financial instruments in this respect are crucial. We have to spend our money only for the trigger effect. So if something can be supported by a financial instrument, grant should not be given, and the managing authority should be there to decide on that. Last point, cooperation. Cooperation is an extremely important strength, but one of the most difficult. Outward looking smart specialization strategies uh, should be there to help cooperation and synergize across territories, across regions, across countries. Without referencing ourselves to the outer world, our smart specialization strategy will be outdated very, very soon. Thank you for your attention. Continuing with the questions yeah, afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charlina. Um, as you said, we will come back to these um, points in the, dis um, in the discussion. I think it was a very interesting um, presentation from the perspective of DJ Regio on, on, on money, on um, the conditions for the uh, managing authorities in the, in the regions. Um, I would like now. Um, I would like to give the floor to uh, Andrea Conte from the Joint uh, Research Center in uh, Sevilla. He's an um, economist there, uh, leading a team, I think, on uh, stairways to excellence, and indeed monitoring and researching the implementation of uh, smart specialization strategies, uh, which can help us, uh, I believe, uh, tremendously to understand how well the concept uh, functions. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh I, I really thank the organizer for uh, this timely opportunity to discuss uh, an important issue, the monitoring of the smart specialization strategy, which uh, is becoming a true priority in this, uh, in this period of activity. So, um, my name is Andrea Conte. I'm coordinating one of the thematic activities of the smart specialization platform, which is a joint activity run by the Directorate General Joint Research Center together with the GRIGIO uh, since 2011, where we have uh, helped regions and member states to strategically design and prepare the smart uh, specialization strategies. Um, I will make just a very brief introduction of the, on the, let's say, narrative uh, rationale of the overall concept before moving towards uh, a more specific uh, uh, presentation linked to the monitoring. But since the audience is quite uh, heterogeneous here, probably it's important to, to describe why we are there and what's the rationale of our activities uh, since, uh, since 2011. As we know, especially in this multiannual financial uh, framework in this period 1420, as never before there is a thematic concentration towards uh, knowledge base uh, uh, investment activities linked to community funding. Uh, if we take the latest G board uh, available, the total gross expenditure in research and development for the whole EU 28, uh, this is roughly equal to 92 billions of euros per year. If we take over the seven years the community budget linked to the different community funding programs, structural funds, Horizon 2020, and so on, this basically means that in the EU, one euro out of ten is coming from community funding. So there is a, a twofold big objective there, which is, uh, let's say, the, the rationale of our activity. First of all, uh, we aim at cohesion policy, a fundamental uh, issue uh, linked to a self-standing uh, 
uh, union as the union that we want, uh, but we go far beyond that by linking two objectives that at least in the past seem to be uh, diverging, meaning cohesion and efficiency of spending. So we truly believe that uh, we could reconcile those two uh, important objectives at the EU level, at the smart specialization strategy as an ex-ante conditionality linked to one of the major drivers of economic growth, welfare um, in the EU uh, has been decided for that, uh, for that reason. Uh, spending uh, thematically concentrating investments in, uh, let's say, converging regions towards knowledge-based investment is for the sake of the whole EU. It's a way we aim through the participatory process the entrepreneurial discovery process we, we emphasize so much, uh, we have been emphasizing in the preparation of the strategy, it will be one of the building blocks of the monitoring activities we have now, uh, are done for the sake of making the endogenous potential of regions, the skillful, the most dynamic part of those regions, emerging and finding a path for self-development uh, in those member states and regions which for the now are lagging behind. And this is not a regional exercise, but it's an exercise made for the sake of the whole EU 28. Um, what we are doing, uh, the first important message is that the monitoring is not a novel exercise disconnected from the preparation of the strategies, uh, which was the objective of the activity so far. There is a continuation, important linkages uh, in the overall exercise that make us uh, linking all the preparation to the implementation of the, of the strategies so far. In, the, uh, in our platform, we mainly act as a facilitator of the process. So we talk to managing authorities and to all other regional uh, and national stakeholders which are involved uh, in the innovation process, and we favor via our uh, tools, uh, both uh, analytically and more, uh, let's say, policy-oriented, uh, communication and uh, in-depth support to member states and regions which want to deepen knowledge and better target uh, the objective under the S3 exercise. So uh, we put a lot of emphasis with our partners in member states and region on the preparation, during the preparation of the S3 on the monitoring aspect, uh, because we consider since the beginning of the overall exercise, this a crucial element of the overall strategy. In truth, what we are witnessing uh, is that exactly those regional member states which have come up with the most sound analysis on the strategy are also those that have put already in place uh, or have designed most effective mechanism for monitoring. So this is to reinforce the message that the two issues, the design on one side and the implementation and the monitoring on the others are truly one important exercise. So um, back on the issue of facilitating this exchange of knowledge, uh, uh, we provide, especially on the monitoring, uh, we will provide in the coming month the results of a survey we have just launched to our contacts in regions and member states on the monitoring of the process. We will be in the position to provide those interests with good practices, data source, case studies, and in general methodologies, which will be used in our traditional let's say, platforms being peer learning uh, workshop, uh, mutual learning conferences where we put together people from different regions and member states to share experience on issues of interest for, for them. Um, why do we want a monitoring system for the, for the S3? For three uh, main objectives. We need the clear information on the development effects of the overall transformation process. Um, this is linked to the, let's say, uh, hard exercise in itself, the measurement. But there is a broader issue linked to, the, uh, to enhancing the participation of the relevant stakeholders 
only a transparent mechanism can create and build trust among the different participants in the regions and in the member states. And only in this way we can ensure a long-lasting relations throughout the whole programming period. In general, we need to uh, condensate and unify the overall exercise that started from the uh, planning of the overall strategies. The S3 uh, logic of intervention, the logic of intervention which has been used in the smart specialization strategy design implementation so far has been, first of all, a recognition of what we call it the challenges and needs. Evidence-based, but with a relevant policy dimension in the selection of the elements. The formulation of the strategic objectives, uh, which we support a push for being as much as possible aligned to many of the uh, EU level type of uh, uh, strategies, Europe 2020 and so on. So to make also more feasible linkages between different, uh, different policies. And the selection of elements at the regional levels that allows to meet the objectives. Here there is a clear distinction that we need to make between the so-called priorities and the policy mixes. In the priorities, uh, in the smart specialization strategy, we have put a lot of emphasis on priorities, meaning on line of activities, um, knowledge, we, we call it knowledge domain and market niches. So we did not want to have a sectoral, a standard sectoral base type of policy intervention. We mostly aim at a let's say, dynamic process through the EDP process, which has been mentioned before, which is a crucial element of the overall exercise at the regional level, for identifying activities, cross-sectoral, uh, horizontal in scope, and not only that could support uh, the emergence of the innovation potential in those regions. Uh, now, in order to reach uh, what we call it uh, the, uh, the expected results under, uh, under uh, the priorities, we will need to introduce uh, policy mixes, the policy instruments that will need to be used for, uh, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for affecting the economy that, uh, in the way in which we aim. Therefore, it's important to make a distinction between what we call it result and output indicator. And this is the framework we use in the, we will use in the monitoring exercise uh, uh, from now onwards. Result indicators will refer to, uh, to the priorities, while output indicators will refer to the evaluation of the specific policy instrument or policy mix adopt in the context of the implementation of the strategies. We aim at a participatory process, transparent, therefore we support the use of uh, indicators, uh, indicators that could come from different sources because we acknowledge a difficulty in many cases at the regional level in measuring some aspects which are not uh, easily uh, identified I mean, that can be easily reachable via official statistics. So we also aim at uh, progressing on the experimentation together with regions in, uh, in the evaluation of the result indicator. In general, on both the results and the output indicators, uh, we want uh, uh, co-ownership via the entrepreneurial discovery process with the relevant stakeholders in the territory. Uh, this has been done before in the, in the identification of the priorities, in the design of the priorities. Now that we have to move on the implementation, we need this participatory process to be reinforced if possible, because it will be crucial for the overall success of the exercise. So, I conclude on the monitoring with this, uh, let's say, dashboard, the synthetic dashboard of the uh, framework we will, uh, we will use. Uh, uh, this is an example, uh, I will not go through it, but that summarizes somehow 
what we expect in terms of differences between uh, uh, result indicators and output indicators, and why it is important that uh, uh, the evaluation can be conducted uh, between uh, uh, at two different levels, namely both at the priority level and at the policy, policy level. We want to have a more transparent and effective way of uh, rebuilding, uh, uh, let's say, causal chain that goes from the evaluation of the policy instrument to, uh, to the overall reaching of the priorities set out in the smart specialization strategy. So we aim at this setting. We, uh, we really look forward to collaborate with you for the success of the exercise. Uh, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, um, Andrea. Interesting presentation. Uh, in, I liked, uh, in particular, the discussion on the indicators, uh, the selection of indicators uh, to determine the success of the strategies, and uh, I hope we can come back to, to this, uh, this point in a second as well. Um, um, Karen McGuire is, uh, is working at the uh, OECD. She's the uh, head of the Regional Innovation uh, Unit of the OECD Regional Development Policy um, Division. We thought that uh, we'd, we'd bring in someone from, from outside the EU uh, to, you know, to give an additional perspective to what we are discussing here among, uh, I would say, um, uh, among EU member states and uh, sometimes even within our EU bubble. And uh, I believe um, Karen has also a number of very interesting examples from outside the European um, Union on how um, regional innovation strategies, or as we call them, smart specialization strategies, are actually implemented and welcomed by, by local regional uh, politicians. I'm looking forward, Karen. Thank you. Um, so, as it was just mentioned, um, I'm from the regional. Well, I'm from the regional development policy group within the OECD. Um, there are lots of different areas within the OECD that work on themes related to what we're talking about today in terms of uh, innovation, science, technology policy, industry policy. So, I'll try and um, highlight some of the key areas of work across the organization that are maybe relevant for our discussions today. Um, and again, thank you to um, the Latvian authorities, the Commission, the Committee of the Regions, and all those who participated in bringing us together here today. Um, um, so, uh, first I thought I would talk a little bit about some just general background trends that we might want to keep in mind as we, uh, as these strategies are implemented and also as they are, in a sense, um, updated on an ongoing games basis because presumably there's some feedback learning mechanisms that will be taking place. Um, and then a little bit on implementation issues and then um, uh, maybe a couple examples from the United States. So um, one of the areas of work at the OECD that might be interesting for people to think about is the, the work on global value chains and um, trade and value added. Unfortunately, we don't have this broken out at regional level, but the idea being that if we could get a better understanding of where value added is um, achieved in different parts of the value chain, it might help us in, in thinking about the positioning of, of different regions. Uh, and there's been a lot of academic research about unbundling and um, how different tasks are broken out in these value in these value chains, and um, it created a lot of opportunities for many EU regions. Um, it's true that now they're starting to look, um, even at the OECD, uh, as to whether maybe this um, unbundling went too far, and maybe there's a need for co-location because maybe some of this unbundling of tasks uh, was useful for a particular round or a generation of technologies, but maybe for the next round it's good to have them located in the same place. So that might have some impacts on how we think about uh, the regional positioning. Um, another issue may be um, knowledge-based capital. There was a report that came out um, talking about the fact that uh, in actually in some of the advanced economies, there's actually a greater investment in data, software, patents, trademarks, copyrights, firm-specific skills, design, and other areas that are often um, uh, less easy to program into our instruments. And it's something that also raises issues about the types of engagement beyond science and technology 
technology. Um, and maybe just to give an example, um, uh, I, I have a couple of friends who are anthropologists, PhDs in anthropology. They work for a financial services firm. And why do they do that? Because the financial services firm thinks about how can we package our products based on the concepts of ritual, which are part of the anthropological uh, core training, um, to better sell our products and be more productive. So there are all sorts of opportunities that um, can, can come out in these strategies that are maybe sometimes missed because we're not thinking in, in, in those terms. Um, another uh, report that should be coming out soon on data-driven innovation, and I know there's some uh, session later on, on open um, open innovation issues, but it's true that a lot of the work on this data-driven innovation highlights actually the regulatory barriers which were raised earlier this morning. And so in the context of these smart specialization strategies, identifying what are some of these regulatory barriers that need to be removed to combine them will be pretty, I think, pretty important for getting the most out of, uh, out of these efforts. Um, some of the research on the productivity of firms that's been coming out that shows that actually, we, I mean, we, we have this challenge of productivity stagnation in, in many OECD countries. And what they're finding is actually not that um, uh, the leaders are still becoming more and more productive. The problem is the, the difference between the leaders and the, the, the firms that are not converging to this, um, to this productivity frontier. And, and in some cases, you might, might make that analogy with, with regions as well. But we still have to think uh, more about what we can do for, for these firms that are not uh, converging to the, to the frontier. Um, in terms of long-term trends, and we're going to try and do some more research on that to give you some figures uh, in the future. But um, there are pressures for concentration of uh, activity, different types of science innovation activity, and there are pressures for uh, collaboration. We, we haven't fully understood sort of these competing uh, impacts. Um, on regions, but um, it's true that it's hard to see over time uh, the radical shifts. Uh, a lot of things stay relatively constant in terms of the relative position of regions, but if you go down to very specific areas, you can start to see, and that's where maybe this data and the monitoring will be helpful because uh, I'll give an example from uh, Catalonia. Um, we could see over time, over 30 years, that their integration into co-patenting networks in a particular sector they were prioritizing, you could see that that actually was taking hold but you have to go down to a sort of level of detail in the data that maybe we're not as used to doing in, in the regional work. Um, maybe another, another background point is that um, ultimately this, uh, and also for, for political buy-in, this is about uh, growth and jobs. Uh, and um, some of my colleagues are sometimes provocative and, and say to me, well, Karen, what makes you think innovation will actually create jobs? Uh, and so there are, so we still, I think, are, are not fully understanding all of these connections and, and then the types of jobs because um, uh, inequality among people is becoming a very hot topic. Uh, it's um, part of, the OECD just released a new report on, on inequalities being at its highest levels in decades. Um, and so thinking about, you know, how these smart Specialization strategies will have an impact on um, growth in jobs because while it makes uh, sense, and I think a, a paper by the Joint Research Center showed an analysis of the, the different priorities and the strategies um, for the smart specialization. It's not finalized because they weren't all finalized, but it was it was a, a sort of a, a, an overview at that point in time, and it showed that um, actually uh, a lot of the strategies are prioritizing areas. They're not necessarily the um, the largest parts of the economy, which uh, according to the report sort of makes sense in the sense that if you're trying to push uh, development to, into related areas, they're not yet the biggest parts of your economy. Um, on the other hand, we have to think about maybe a bit more how to increase the productivity in those areas that do have uh, big shares of our economy because ultimately for growth and jobs, this is also going to be important. Now, one strategy can't do everything and so we, we can't put too many competing uh, pressures involved, but sometimes that's um, part of the punchline that's going to get, uh, I presume, some of the, the political buy-in. Um, in terms of um, some some considerations in, in implementation, um, I would say, you know, the, the OECD has been doing a lot of work in the regional development world on what we call functional regions, whether it's defining what is a metropolitan area, and actually that was work done with the, the European Commission, um, or uh, rural-urban partnerships, how are urban-rural relationships, and in, in some cases whether that 
often this is focused not on innovation per se, but there might be areas there. And then also we've done some work, and uh, my former colleague Claire Newellers in the room can also uh, give you um, feedback on this project that looked at specifically at cross-border regions, which for the European context are pretty important because a lot of you have borders with each other, and some of your regions on the border in some cases may, it may be interesting to look right on the other side of the border, but there were lots of uh, barriers um, for uh, political reasons, uh, for programmatic reasons. Um, there's a, a t sort of a tendency to, to focus on which funding pot goes to which purpose, and so I don't want to use structural funds if that's an interreg issue. You know, there are different types of things that would come up. Uh, even if they were allowed to allocate a proportion to cross-border, they weren't doing so necessarily. So, um, so on this on this work on the functional regions, I think it's you know in terms of the proximity elements of uh, the smart specialization strategies, how to build on, on proximity for innovation is, is one uh, area. And then I think what the interesting area that we know less about, which is something that I think is part of the new initiatives, is these interregional networks where it's not a proximity based on geography, but a proximity based on technology or, or, or something else. And that'll be, I think, very interesting to see how that works and how those dynamics are going to be different between knowledge networks, which are often very international, versus um, um, getting the place-based impacts of jobs associated with uh, some other forms of, of networks. Um, in terms of also just trying to put together, regions are often struggling to pull different pots of money from EU, different EU sources, national sources, regional sources, et cetera. Um, one of the things that just perennially comes up is um, how the different pots of money, how we create the, our own barriers to being able to combine them, to use them in ways that are, that are most effective for the region. Um, and that's something that's, uh, I mean, it's true when you look at the cross-border, you could see that actually there was um, not only an administrative but a psychological barrier. If you looked at patent citation spillovers, you could see that actually um, the border wiped out all the proximity benefits in terms of the likelihood of, of, of citing a patent on the other side of the border. So there, th this sort of um, issues associated with um, proximity, with administrative barriers, and with, um, with other issues. How much time do I have? Just uh, two minutes, three minutes, okay. Um, I think also um, there have been some different papers uh, by the Joint Research Center and some other uh, issues about what are the roles of different key actors in these different strategies. And I think, um, you know, universities we've seen in our regional innovation reviews, which predated the word smart specialization, but we're trying to look at different innovation strategies of regions. Um, in some cases, universities were sort of uh, too much burden was put on them in expectations of what they could do for the region as institutions, and in some cases maybe they weren't uh, as engaged enough. So I think they'll be, um, but, but one thing that came out in, in these and other work from our education group is just that um, the incentives for universities are not necessarily aligned always with uh, some of the expectations for their engagement in these regional strategies and understanding how to adjust those incentives which are often out of the hands of a region uh, but are sort of national uh, uh, conditions and then peer review research is going to change a bit um, the different forms of engagement they can play in these um, uh, smart specialization strategies. Um, maybe just uh, to, to end on a couple of um, examples, um, we, did a, we did a review of the Chicago um, metropolitan, tri-state metropolitan area, and there are uh, two examples of how they, political uh, interest in this sort of areas of, of innovation specialization. Um, the first example I'll give is the, the Water Council um, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and this is something that might not have come up on the radar screens due to um, sort of big picture cluster location quotient type analyses, but local leaders said, you know, we have a history of using a lot of water with food and beverage manufacturing. We have a lot of fresh water nearby, and actually our university has some competencies in fresh water. We really need to put this all together. And that, I think, helped capture a bit the imagination of some of the local politicians in a way that uh, is different from sometimes the more um, uh, analytic uh, initiation. Now, obviously, we have to track. Maybe, maybe this doesn't uh, overall make sense, but it is an opportunity to build on what they had. Another one in Chicago where the IT industry, usually when you think of the United States, you don't think of Chicago and IT necessarily, you think of maybe the coasts. Um, and they were actually very upset that a lot of their um, uh, Chicago natives um, were leaving for the coasts. And then um, a firm called Groupon took off, and it totally changed the perception of political leaders about the role of IT in the economy. And then they started to see that actually they were very good at IT in business-to-business -business relations because that's sort of a specialty of 
Chicago as a sort of hub of headquarters and, and businesses and logistics. So they, um, so these were different ways of, in a sense, capturing the imagination in order to get this maybe more embedded into um, big picture strategies. And I guess maybe uh, I'll just end with a comment about the fact that these um, smart specialization strategies ha are in a sort of bigger picture and often, you know, skills issues um, are important to keep in mind because uh, they're not always managed by the same uh, authorities and the same strategies. And yet, actually, the, the OECD research on uh, regional growth shows that um, lack, uh, that, that, that actually it's the share of low-skilled workers more than the share of high-skilled workers that's the drag um, on growth. And so that, that just leaves us some, um, some context for we're working often at the, the high-skilled end, but we still need to think about what's going on uh, at the other end of the spectrum in order to get the sort of overall growth and jobs objectives that I think uh, are desired by some of these funds. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, I like, the, um, I like the example where you mentioned that uh, you need to capture also the imagination of the local politicians. And it, it's not only an analy analytical exercise done by uh, researchers or uh, scientists in the region, but it's also about the, uh, the political environment. Um, I also found this uh, example of anthropologists designing financial products. Uh, I'm a bit scary, but um, <laughs> very interesting. Very interesting. Um, let us now come to um, Günther Klar, when I introduced the speakers, I was not quite correct. Um, he's not the chairman of the Commission Expert Group on Smart Specialization, but the chairman of the Commission Expert Group on the Assessment of Smart Specialization Strategies for the, uh, for the 28 um, member states. And um, it's also very interesting, he's, he's from um, a region which is probably the most innovative uh, region in, in, in Europe, I would say, when you, when you pass, pass by Stuttgart and, 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 and Tübingen in this region, you see uh, um, IT firms and you, you see world market leaders in, in, in every, every industry you can imagine, just in a distance bit, um, of a um, few hundred meters or, um, almost, everything is full of exploding uh, firms and businesses, so it's um, probably a very inspiring uh, environment um, for your task and we are um, very eager to find out um, how the um, strategies are implemented in member states and what your findings are going to. Thank you Christoph for this um, motivating um, introduction and good morning to all of you. I just can agree with the motto of, uh, of our conference, it's time to act, but the work of our expert group clearly showed it's not time for business as usual. And uh, this expert group was established by uh, DG Research, the unit of Dimitri Kaupakis, one of these uh, hosts of this conference. And we had really uh, different, uh, different aspects. Do we have the slide here? No, it doesn't matter. Uh, we should look at the contribution of these strategies to the Europe 2020 growth strategy. So not doing the, norm, the assessment work, the formal assessment work, we are not involved in these processes, but we should look from this, uh, from this higher Europe, uh, Euro, EU 28 perspective on that. Uh, we have developed a broad spectrum of suggestions for the way forward, and this is operational suggestions, this is policy suggestions, but we also found it necessary to make structural uh, suggestions which cannot be implemented immediately, but which should be addressed during this programming period, and maybe they could help to start the next programming period with, uh, on a better base. Uh, as Christoph mentioned, I come from a region which is quite successful in innovation and so I think it's important to mention that uh, research and innovation strategies for smart specialization are around for a long time. For a long time. If you take a medium-sized company in our days, what do they do? They look where their strengths are they assess their growth potential, and growth potential in globalized economy means, of course, looking outside. 
and uh, they have to set their priorities because funds are limited and then they have to impl implement the monitoring system. Maybe not the way the platform can do this, but they have to have the internal monitoring system because otherwise they go out of the market. So that's evident in a way and if you have a su successful cluster, it's the same story. And if you have uh, innovation in, in successful region, it's also at the end what they are doing, they are doing um, smart specialization. So it's not a commission, it's not a commission invention, the smart specialization. But it could become a true EU innovation. Innovation, if we succeed to implement the essence of this approach in all regions and specifically if we manage through this approach, truly adapted, to integrate the less innovative regions in the European research area. Because then the contribution to Europe 2020 will really be much better than they are today. So, <clears throat> we have already heard more or less from different aspects what uh, research and innovation strategies for smart specialization are. And of course, we looked in our review on do they really use a wide concept of innovation, not only looking at research and te technology innovation, do they, after the strategy, develop a policy mix for implementation that is linked to the strategy and this and is based on the realities of the regions. Because sometimes we have seen they do their strategy and then the policy mix of implementation does not fit to the strategy. A key issue, and I think we agree all on this, is to, to work on a broad human capital agenda. You cannot do research, you cannot do innovation, you cannot do successful marketing and internationalization if you don't have the human resources. The human resources in the companies, the human resources also in administration. So you need an administration that is competent to establish a governance that enables the implementation of these support programs. Um, so do we see this in the strategies? If we look at this human capital agenda, of course, then immediately the question is, are they able to develop strategies? Are they able to manage research and innovation strategies? So the question is, do we have the strategic capacities and do we have the methodological capacities to do this well? As Charlena mentioned, it's not the point of spending money, it's spending it wisely. And you can only spend it wisely if you know how to, how to do this. Very important, and this aspect is not only in Europe, it's in the United States, it's, it's all over the, the world, are the needs of the SMEs addressed? And I would really like to make the point, are the needs of the different types of SMEs addressed? We have high-tech startups, software companies that need a totally different approach than if you have small manufacturing companies somewhere in the outskirts and not in the, in, the, in the city region. So different needs of different types of SMEs. Uh, if we talk now about smart specialization strategies in cohesion policy, the question is of course, do they really understand that societal challenges can be drivers of economic growth. Can societal, how can you use the societal challenges in your region as a driver for economic growth? Openness, it I talked about this mid-sized company in the beginning, of course they look at the global market. Do the regions look what's happening outside their region, their continent, what's happening along the value chains that could be profitable for them. So openness means looking outside your region, openness means also looking beyond the policy fields, 
not only research and uh, innovation policy, it's social policy, it's education policies, it's financial support policies. So are they able to look beyond the different policy fields? And of course in Europe, are they able to look what's happening at the national level, what's happening at the European level? And uh, what is very important uh, for me to check is, is there real a coherent line from analysis to strategy to implementation to a new analysis, what comes after that. And a very simple thing to look at for us was, is there a dedicated V3 budget? So as you can already see from my introduction where we looked into, um, the conclusion is that we see on the political, on the high level political level, that the EU is moving in the right direction. There are changes that are going in the right direction to keep Europe in business. And we see a lot, a lot of very motivated and very motivating initiatives that started in the regions. So this is clear, there is progress but it's still a very bumpy road ahead. And the divide has been mentioned from, from, uh, from Wolfgang Burcher to, to other contributions. Uh, we see a lot, we see more progress in regions that are already advanced. So the divide is there and we are not sure uh, if if all regions have taken the new approach seriously, that they should focus on their strengths and on their reality. And many regions still try to copy the advanced region and this is not the road to progress. So if I go in uh, some concrete suggestions now, the first message to the cohesion policy community, the first key message is, if you are tasked with doing research and innovation strategies, you should really work with the research and innovation community. It is, it is a real, real, uh, it's really daring, you know, that policy at a high political level decides you managing authority now have to do research and innovation strategies with managing authorities that sometimes do not have much experience in research and innovation field, that don't, do not have many uh, human resources. So work together with the research innovation policy, together with research and innovation support organization, and work together with the research and innovation organizations themselves. This is the key message to the cohesion policy community. If you look at the regions and the results that we had uh, looked, we could not assess research and innovation strategy as defined by cohesion policy in all regions because not all regions and countries had finalized them. So in some cases, we had, uh, uh, we had the, the agreements with the commission and they say they will finalize it. I think this is a good thing that many have not finalized their strategies because now they can look what has happened somewhere else. And I would suggest they should look not only on the structural funds V3, they should also look on the V3 going on outside the structural funds. The entrepreneurial discovery process is another key issue. I agree that it's important but there is a high risk that this gets either a tick the box exercise or very myopic. Sometimes we see the SW of SWOT is done well, the OT is kind of, and the real need for, for more foresight type approach and impact assessment approach is not there. So, 
There is a need for methodological guidance, and I think the platform has a very important role, not only monitoring these things, but really continue giving methodological guidance on, on this process. Uh, for all the regions, we would say, yes, uh, relate to other strategy processes. Not saying relate to Horizon 2020, but look where in Horizon 20 are similar strategies forming, are similar consortia forming, try to learn from them. Um, the, the, the word synergies is used very often and um, sometimes we have very concrete suggestions. We have a very good guide for synergies that focuses mostly on Horizon 2020 and Cosme. But we have other programs, the Connecting Europe facility. We have uh, uh, these employment and social innovation programs. And here in Latvia, where the presidency has put a focus on, uh, on the Eastern partnership, you should not forget we have European neighborhood instruments that could be used by the Eastern region, by the Mediterranean regions. And we haven't seen any reference to the European neighborhood instrument. For the regions in the Balkans, we have the pre-accession assistance. It is sometimes easy money, very easy money to get research money from these programs than going for a highly competitive call in Horizon 2020. So synergy, take synergy seriously. And uh, I will finish now. We have uh, so many suggestions and the report will come out soon, Dimitri, you said. Okay, so I will just leave it here and say it's time to act and that means for us here discussing, it's time to implement the RIS-3 in a way that they contribute to the Europe 2020 goals through regional prosperity. This is the real goal. The challenge is we still need much more information. I see this in discussion how, how information is still uh, not very common. Um, we need not only more information, we need reform and the cooperation spaces that have been mentioned by the other speakers. We have to create more cooperation spaces. And that means, of course, if we address these challenges, then the opportunities are much bigger than we see then today to increase the impact, because impact assessment is important as much in research innovation as in cohesion policy. Impact of own activities to increase, enlarge the contribution to Europe 2020, and of course, the support agencies and the policy makers have also the responsibility to incentivize better cooperation in other areas with other actors, but they have to show how they cooperate and that makes it easier for the other ones. And then the last thing that I mentioned briefly in the beginning, reforming not only cohesion policy, but the European 2020 strategy. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Günther. Um, I'm just going to give back some, some questions to the, to the panelists uh, in order to, to, to focus a bit more, go a bit more into detail. Um, um, my first question to, to Günther, the, the, um, the integration of the strategy into the EU 2020, into the, um, into the economic um, governance system established at EU level. Um, what are your suggestions there? How can that be done? <clears throat> I mean, if we start here in the cohesion policy field, of course, uh, uh, we said, yes, a cohesion policy, uh, what they could do uh, in, in looking at their contribution. Uh, one thing you mentioned, I think you, Charlina, mentioned the shared management system. Uh, it is very important we still have uh, 
the biggest time for the cohesion policy for the operation program is still in ahead of us. So we have many years that this shared management is really becoming a true partnership. That it's not only accountancy, you know, do they spend the money the way they should spend the money, but really, really working in a, in a partnership uh, to adapt constantly in a good way to uh, increase the, the efficiency of the spending. And as we were looking from, from a larger perspective, we had also, we had analyzed the whole process that we call cohesion policy knowledge transformation process. Cohesion policy knowledge transformation. You have uh, the negotiations, and then you have the regulations, you have the, the base for working. You transmit this from council and commission into the regions, the regions have to absorb the regulation, they try to do their strategies, they have to give it back to the managing authority that is then negotiating with DG Regio. So this is a whole process and it's interesting to see how the knowledge is transformed in this process. And we have seen that this process is still a very fragile process. So sometimes we have seen very good entrepreneurial process but didn't end up in DG Regio. So our longer term suggestion is to analyze the process to see where are the weaknesses in the process and work, start already working on, uh, on an improved process for the next uh, programming period. So the Europe 2020 goes more directly is uh, we have, and you, know, you all know this, we have different elements to uh, achieve the Europe 2020 goals. We have cohesion policy, we have Horizon 2020, uh, we have, have different, different elements that are either more regional, more transnational, more research innovation, more so so societal challenges. And this is good because we need different ways of approaching these goals. But what we see is that key conditions should be met to really improve the overall contribution to Europe 2020. And the first thing is to harmonize time frames. The semester process was already mentioned. The semester process is a very, very important process because it's a true partnership between the Commission and the Council or the Member States. It's an ongoing process, six months, six months, every, every year it is repeated. But the operational programs at the time being, you know, they are agreed and then it's very difficult to change them really whatever the semester process says. And this is the first thing what I would say is harmonizing uh, frame, time frames. The other thing is the strategy processes. The strategy processes, they should also be harmonized. So don't get me wrong, the different elements should keep their strengths. Horizon 2020 will always be research and innovation. But the strategy processes and the evaluation processes they should be better harmonized. And so this is what, uh, what I would say. We have, we have more concrete suggestions, but I think the key thing is time frame, strategy, and evaluation. Uh, and then, of course, we hope that the cohesion policy is leading to reforms in other elements of Europe 2020. This is very important that we learn from cohesion policy. And if you know the, uh, the blueprint for, for a new Europe 2020 by the Committee of the Regions, they have made very, very clear suggestions how to reform other parts of the Europe 2020 strategy. Um, Karen, one question. Um, you mentioned the involvement of the, of the private sector in uh, smart uh, specialization uh, strategies. Can you elaborate that a bit, bit more? Uh, yeah, well, I, I think maybe just a general observation because we've looked at different strategies with, I mean, they, they might have different names, not all smart specialization, but are focused on trying to develop uh, innovation 
innovation-driven uh, uh, growth in the region. And um, what we see often is that there's a, a bit of um, an excessive public sector influence in the European examples relative to some of the other examples. And that um, this is in part, um, I, I mean, if you go to different places, you know, and you ask to look at their documents, sometimes uh, the um, just the language and the way they're drafted, it's more of a, um, a public administration exercise. The, um, and maybe behind it, there was a lot of engagement um, in the process of developing the strategy, and then it just gets translated by certain people in the drafting. But, um, but it, it wasn't sure that they were taking as strong a leadership role as we've seen in some other places. And I think, uh, even just to give an example, even the delivery of some of these, um, not necessarily very specific um, research innovation, but regional development more generally, uh, there was a case uh, at the border of um, uh, the U.S. and Mexico that was involved in our cross-border projects, and they even said, you know what, the public sector, they were so uh, arguing again, you know, amongst themselves in this cross-border region that the, the private sector said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take over some of these responsibilities, and we're going to do uh, the identification and, and, and tell the public sector what we want to have done in order to make this, uh, this area work. And I think um, just finding ways of that ongoing process because SMEs, well, okay, high-tech SMEs and incubators are easy to reach, okay? You know where they are, they're often getting money and, you know, they're articulate and uh, et cetera. But um, often the, there's a challenge with the, the, the sort of general SME population and getting them represented in some of these kinds of in, uh, consultation bodies and committees um, in the development of public sector strategies. And another thing that has come up in some of our committee discussions is that in, in regions that maybe are less dense in terms of population and, and economic activity, that you often have all of these different committees, but it's the same person on all of the mm -hmm. committees. And so you, you end up having a, a challenge of trying to get different perspectives. And then maybe just also in, in terms of the types of institutions, but also the, the types of people. Um, even uh, that we were talking with the, the, the person responsible for supporting innovation in, in Pittsburgh, for the mayor of Pittsburgh. And uh, she was saying that actually she had a hard time linking the big firms that were, you know, sort of there for decades with the sort of ecosystem of new startup firms and that there was sort of a cultural divide and that she was having trouble getting them to sort of link together. So the public sector definitely can do a lot of interesting things to, to make this happen, but um, I think sometimes the leadership angle is a bit too, too much public sector driven in a topic where obviously it's the, the private sector that has to take the lead in, in commercializing mm -hmm. innovations. Thank you. Um, Andrea, um you mentioned um, also that uh, the more so sound analysis um, there is, the, the, the better the implementation. Other panelists mentioned also the fact that um, it's always easier to innovate in, in already innovative uh, regions. Um, can you des describe this a bit in your, um, can you see this in your, in your analysis and what do you tell the uh, lagging behind regions, what they can do in order to overcome these, these problems? Well, I will, based on the experience, let's say on the ground, on the workshops, uh, peer reviews we have made, I will not draw such a black and white distinction between the goods and the bad ones. We have experience of lagging regions uh, which have done well in terms not only of participation to, to the different exercise which uh, provides clear inputs for those who are in charge of the design before implementation now of the smart specialization strategy to share experiences and so on. But we had also some positive feedbacks in terms of the preparation of the strategy themselves, uh, overall preparatory activities behind. Um, obviously, interacting with so many regions uh, makes also almost natural to have an heterogeneous type of reply to quality response rate, let's say, to the, to, the, to the call we make for a good design of the uh, strategies. Uh, I'm optimist in the sense that uh, we are running a novel exercise in which many different actors, uh, for the effective success of the exercise, we need to put on board many different actors. So it's not something uh, that we can measure on a quarterly based. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's say we need to go through the whole process. Uh, we acknowledge that there are regions which have not moved 
with the speed that we aim at the beginning. So we will concentrate our efforts in that way. Uh, where, let's say uh, below the, um, uh, the different umbrella activities run by the platform, there are some initiatives which look at specific regions and member states, exactly because we think that uh, the degree of uh, responsibility we need to put in place in collaboration with those authorities is different according to the different needs uh, that those regional member states have. So we will uh, follow this process uh, for the time being, trying to adopt as much as possible a flexible way of organizing our work in collaboration in collaboration with them. Thank you. Um, Charina, we've been um, speaking a lot about the, the human factor, the need for reform, the need to uh, now implement the uh, smart specialization strategies in regions. Um, you, you mentioned that the, 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 the money spent on innovation in the, in the, in the programs has, has gone up in, the, in, in past years. My question would be: I mean, when when you when you talk to regions and and uh, you present the the new the new programs and you tell them now is the time to act, now is the time to re reform, now is the time to prioritize, do they like that? Do they prioritize only the programs uh, for the money DG Regio is giving them, or is it is it indeed a, a um, change of mentality in the regions that suddenly everybody thinks? Yes, now we focus on, on only these, these points. Um, how do you, do you perceive this in the, in the regions? Uh, as a matter of fact, there is always a reluctance in the system to continue to do what uh, have been done for years. And I have to say that one of the challenges now is that we are trying to change the growth model. At least we are trying to change what we are supporting as a growth model. Because if you look into the cohesion policy uh, track record, it has been so much uh, infrastructure so far. I'm not trying to underestimate the, the need of uh, transport environment and all this type of infrastructure. But now we want to really concentrate on knowledge-based economy. And of course, there is a bit of a reluctance. Because whenever you have a support for years um, in, in uh, certain areas, there is a build-up around. So it's not easy. So we have to work on that. It, it is a cultural change. Maybe mentality change, cultural change is too strong. Uh, in order to, to shift the real focus and to make it dear to the heart of the managing authorities, the innovation and research. So there was um, uh, here a statement that um, the managing authorities should work with the research and innovation communities. Indeed. But please, research community, make yourself dear to the managing authorities. Work with them. So it's, it's, it's a double effort. Um, we, we have to work together. Uh, this commission now is very much about breaking silence. Uh, everybody says that um, we understand how important it is. It is difficult to implement. So working together, this is the hardest thing that I've seen so far in the six years that I'm doing uh, so many countries in my, in, in my career. So uh, bringing research uh, with um, uh, administration, bringing, for example, uh, uh, the macro-regional contact points with the managing authorities, these are things that are difficult to happen. And it, it has to become a, a modus operandi. Uh, something that uh, is, uh, uh, as, is of critical importance for us is that we make it work, we make the cooperation happen, we make um, the things happen on the edge of the sectors because we are talking about value chains, we are talking about uh, things that develop on the edge, edge of sectors. This is the real potential for, for innovation. Again, working together is the key word. So let's work together. Uh, let uh, make innovation and research uh, dear to the heart of everyone involved, and I really hope that we are going to succeed and we will achieve the results that we've uh, we've seen uh, as uh, exemplary indicators. We uh, we've tried our best by concentration of resources, obligatory concentration of resources to gear the process, but now it's really on the ground uh, um, uh, that this has to happen. So I will end up here with uh, uh, very good wishes for the conference. Uh, I hope that um, everything that we talked about will be, um, uh, will be at least uh, food for thought. And uh, let's be uh, more result-oriented and more uh, open in, in, in our working methods. Thank you, Celina.
Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, my apologies that we do not have time now to uh, start the discussion here in the, in the plenary. Uh, we will have lots of time to uh, discuss, and I have plenty of questions noted down that I would like to discuss with them. We have a chance to discuss that uh, during the lunch break. Um, before I have an important announcement to make uh, for, the, for the lunch break, I would uh, like to ask you, together with me, to thank all the panelists for this very interesting um, discussion. We are look, all looking forward to going more into detail in the uh, afternoon sessions and, uh, and tomorrow morning. So thank you very much. And, the, and the, the, import, the important announcement um, I, I have to make, um, there's also the, launch, the launching of the Horizon 2020 widespread uh, project. It's the teaming project Kamat in the lunch break, and it's in the LIGO, Ligo hall. So, bon appétit, guten appétit. <laughs>